Good morning, everyone. Glad you can make us part of your holiday weekend. Glad that you all saw your way safely through that yellow film of pollen over your windshield this morning. Glad you made it. Glad you're here. Welcome those watching at home and wherever you might be. I know traveling, it's a great time to have the uh, live stream available, and we're very glad that you can join us as well. Um, I have some announcements to start our time together. This is the beginning of the kids' club season, and so they're gathering in the upper room, and I understand outdoors is in the works. It's a beautiful time, a great day to be outside. So we're grateful for that, grateful for Julie and those who work with her to have the uh, summer kids' club program. Um, need to make a, a little uh, adjustment in the summer schedule. Some of you got this um, of the summer schedule for the youth. Uh, the Sundays, uh, the 5th and the 12th, the community service, uh, versus the regular meeting time, that's uh, being switched so that on the 5th, they're just having a regular meeting with that new 6 p.m. chill time. And uh, then at, uh, on the 12th, they will do their moving and stacking logs, kind of some firewood. This is sort of like fuel bank work, isn't it? And so we're grateful for that. Um, so Grades and Grace continues on until the school year is over, uh, 5 p.m. Um, great time and always good to have folks take part and uh, a chance to... Uh, have our youth have a safe place and a, and a comforting place uh, that they can gather at. Um, remember, those of us with a couple of more miles under our, or on our tires, we've been challenged to wiffle ball. There will be a dinner beforehand, but we've been challenged to wiffle ball. And so that's uh, on Saturday the 11th, 5 p.m. for the dinner. And I assume that afterward is the, is the, is the food. You want us to slow down by the chicken in our guts? Uh, chair leaders, right. Okay, good. <laughs> Some of us who played really can't play, but that's all right. All right. Um, Breeze is this wonderful tool we have to be aware of, uh, who, you know, gee, who's that person I met and what was their email and all that? Um, you want to help using that? It's, it's a, something that we share as privileges with our, with our membership. Uh, if you want to learn how to use that, on the 12th, two Sundays from today, after service, 11:20 uh, p.m. We'll, we'll go over that. A.M. 11:20. Right. It's still morning. <laughs> okay. We want to be uh, congratulating our graduates. I think there might be one in the col up there, a graduate up there, Xavier. Congratulations. And uh, uh, we want to make sure that we get all those announcements in. Let us know, please. Um, our dinner and a movie always needs more sponsors. Please see Donna Easter if you would be willing to do that. And uh, please use also the Let's Connect cards. If you've not filled one out yet, it helps us get using the breeze so that we can um, connect with each other, but also keep you informed of weekly announcements and any special ones as well. We are still preparing the Lenten booklet. Please get it in by the end of June. And then also, uh, Take advantage of Soul Fest. Kathy, what you got? what were we all doing a year ago? We know exactly now. Okay, great. Well done. Well played. Very good. And uh, we, we'd love to have people help uh, put on the, the audiovisual and the live stream and the other issues that help us be able to do a service. Uh, you know, we, we need to uh, have a broad bank of folk who can do this. So, you know, it, you know Frank had to schedule getting COVID. You know, he, he had to tell us when he was going to have COVID so we could have backup. So, please do uh, help out when you can. So thank you all for that. And we are grateful for the significance of this weekend. And we need to not only be thankful to those who've made our freedom on earth healthy, but let us also join to worship the one who gives us courage, freedom, and life eternal. Let's uh, join in our worship of God Let's stand together and sing as the worship team leads us.
Walter said something this morning about God waiting for us. He's waiting for our praises. He's waiting to shower his love on us and to teach us. And so as we come with these songs, uh, this, this first song, No Greater Love, is, is just a, a really special song to show us what God's love does in our lives.
Thank you for your amazing grace. Uh, responsive reading today. Look at the birds of the air. They never sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet our heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink? Oh, what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and for all these things will be given to you as well. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, everyone who contributes to prayers. I got some prayer requests and concerns, but as we were coming in this morning, always important to do that. Our world needs the intercession that we can give so that we have the intervention from God. Let's pray together. Lord, we honor you, the, the master of all creation. You gave earth to us to be stewards. Oh, Lord, help us to care for it. But we thank you for its beauties, for the joy that comes with spring and early summer, the, uh, the opportunity to just revel in the goodness you've given us. We thank you for it. Lord, our hearts are so grateful for the uh, opportunity to celebrate Bruno and Sarah's anniversary. Bless them, Lord. Thank you for this year, for all the good that's come in it, and for all that lies ahead. Hold them in your care and lead them. Bless them each in their opportunities for service to you. Thank you, Lord, for those who've had a remarkable recovery. We're grateful for Kent and Gail's recovery, Lord. Grateful for your hand that is at work, and thank you. Oh, Lord, would you uh, be with those who need your healing touch? For uh, Gary, as he waits for surgery, that that would be happening soon and be successful. That you'd be with Pete and Danielle in their ongoing battles, that they might find the victory in you for each one, Lord. Lord, Carol and I thank you, as all of us do, that you protected our son Ben, who's had a burst appendix and is in a hospital in San Diego. Continue that healing. Thank you for the good care that he's received. So, Lord, with Kathy as she recovers, for Dan, Laura's brother-in-law, who's in hospice. Thank you that Laura's had good progress since her knee struggles. Please be with Peggy as she waits for back surgery. For those who are looking for kidney transplant land, provide, Lord, please provide for Corey, for Rachel, for others. Thank you that Ruth Ann Fleming is on the, way, on the mend from her COVID. And we pray, Lord, for our Ron Charland, He's still at Brockton Signature Signature Hospital. He's got issues with his balance. Lord, we pray your hand be upon him. 
be with his family, help them as they seek to find a, a good place for Ron to be after the hospital time is done. Lord, we thank you that Sarah was able to provide good grief care for, at, in the service of remembering Don Reynolds. Lord, put your comfort on the family and all those who are grieving. On this Memorial Day weekend, we remember especially Gold Star families and others who were a, a loved one in service to the nation, gave the ultimate sacrifice. Put your comfort on those who survive. And also, Lord, on those who deal with lifelong disability because of their time of service. Please continue, Lord, to put your hand upon our armed service members. We pray your, your peace, Lord, your comfort, consolation on the families and others affected by the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. And we pray, Lord, for politics to be put aside and solutions to be found. Let us put our trust in you not in our guns. Let us put our trust in you, not in our politics. Let both aisles, Lord, both sides, humble themselves and serve you. We ask, Lord, for your comfort, your intervention on behalf of the nation of Ukraine. We pray for the aggressors to be driven out. We pray for peace, and especially that you would provide for those who have left their home and are dealing with very difficult circumstances. For the folks of Samaritan's Purse, World Kitchen, and many others that are seeking to provide needs there, Lord, we ask your mercy, your blessing, your provision. Help us to be generous towards those in need. And Lord, even as we give honor to those who died that we might enjoy earthly freedom, make us ever mindful of the great sacrifice. Lord, you died to make men holy. Thank you also for those who died that we might be free, but thank you for the greatest. There is no greater love. As we pledge ourselves to be yours and to follow you, we join in our, the prayer you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give to God to honor him. To recognize that he is the source of all of our blessings. Some have given already on the way in the baskets that we keep in the back. Others have mailed it in, used the, the uh, QR code or that's on the screen or in, in the bulk back of the pews behind you, ahead of you, wherever. But we honor God because he gives to us. And we return a portion. And we pray your prayers for the church staff and those in positions of leading that we always be wise, that God might always grant enough, but that we would also treat with Respect, dignity, and integrity, every gift that is given. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you allow us to do ministry. Thank you that we get to be a blessing to the hospital patient, to the grieving family, to the young soul in need of guidance to those perplexed by a challenge and also to strengthen those who might then witness to others. Thank you, Lord, that you meet our every need for every one of us and you promise that if we will indeed seek first your kingdom, you will provide all of our needs. 
So we give to honor you. We trust you for what you've provided. We ask your mercy on those who struggle and that you would grant that all gifts be used to honor and bring glory to the name of Jesus in which we pray. Amen. Let's stand and dedicate these with the song 10,000 Reasons. The reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, uh, 14, 8 to 18. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites who were boldly going out boldly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his chariot drivers and his army. They overtook them camped by the sea, by pi Hephaestroth, in front of baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians." for it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you will have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Dr. Tom. If it bleeds, it leads. It's the time-tested watchword of practical journalism. Newspapers must be sold. The attention of the viewer or the listener must continually be grabbed hold of. If not, the circulation numbers, a key instrument for the advertising sales whose clients want to reach as large an audience as possible, that'll suffer. As will the financial bottom line of the media outlet. 
So, as a result, headlines are always over-sensationalized. And during times of crisis, unsubstantiated theories are stated as near fact, all in a desperate attempt to build the audience. You know, I, I, I knew I was getting older when I had to be explained what clickbait was. Because if ever there was false headlines, they, oh, that looks interesting. So what does all this mean to you and me? We want accurate information about the world around us. When the media around us, through which we obtain our information, relies on fear and frenzy for its survival, we're left with a society where peace and serenity are very hard to find. Maybe you've noticed. The American, American Heritage Dictionary tells us we have serenity when we experience clearness of understanding, quietness of heart, stillness in spite of our circumstances, and peace in our hearts. Finding a peaceful heart requires an accurate understanding of all that is, both the natural and the supernatural worlds. If you think Hanson, Massachusetts, the United States, or anywhere else on earth can somehow become the second coming of the Garden of Eden, you will never experience serenity. What's more, if you do not have faith in God, who is real, the God who has shown his love for us in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus, then you have no realistic expectation of what is so desperately wrong, that, or rather that what is so desperately wrong in the world will ever be put right at the culmination of history. So today I want us to all see that serenity recognizes the limits of this life and God's limitless, extravagant love for us. And we have three pieces of biblical evidence. Tom read for us the, uh, from the book of Exodus. The Hebrew people have fled Egypt, the land of their enslavement. They're heading toward the promised land. Pharaoh, having granted them leave after discovering that the Lord God Almighty is better at playing hardball than he was, he's had a change of heart. And he decides he's going to chase after the people he's let go, chase after the people of Israel, and get this free, unpaid workforce back. The Jews have the Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptian armies behind them, and closing fast. Moses experiences that great occupational hazard of leadership. Harsh criticism and resistance from the people who need your help, whether they realize it or not. Was there a problem with the supply chain and gravestones in Egypt? So you brought us here to die in the desert? They moan, they whine, they murmur. Ain't it nice to be appreciated? And Moses shows true leadership by saying what the people need to hear. Keep still and see the salvation of the Lord that he will do for you all today. Maybe that's all you need to hear today. Keep still. Wait for the Lord. He's got this. You can keep your head about you when all around you are losing theirs. If you will remember that God's hand is more powerful than king's armies. We called each other to worship with words from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Isn't it 
peculiar how some people need to be reminded to get out of bed and get to work, and others need to be learned to trust in God's care for us. If you would have serenity in your life, three important truths need to be kept in mind. First, that God knows what you need. He knows what we need. He cares for us is second. And third, that he is more able to provide for us for what we need, more able than we are to provide for ourselves. We have the promise of God that when we keep our priorities straight, seek first the kingdom of God, he will watch out for us. We need not fear. We can be at peace. We do our part, but we do it trusting God. It's one thing to uh, tell others what to do when their serenity is threatened. It's quite another to have to deal with those threats ourselves. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus demonstrated the risk and reward of, trust, of trusting God. He knew what was in his immediate future if he held to his course. Sticky. There we go. It's practically impossible for us to imagine the pain, the torture that death by crucifixion involved. Jesus was both fully human and fully God. If he wasn't fully human, he couldn't rescue the human race. He had to take humanity on himself in order to rescue us. Fully human, fully God. In his humanness, he would have naturally sought to avoid death by crucifixion. But his divine nature was also fully functional. So we see him dealing with both. In the sermon text for today, this is Matthew 26, 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and, two of his, and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here, stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus shows us how to attain the serenity that we need. Even during the most stressful situations, he recognizes the limits of this life and God's limitless extravagant love for us. I graduated from high school so long ago that my kids are surprised the printing press had been invented. <laughs> Not only had it, each graduating senior was given about 35 words that we could put, have printed under our, our photograph. And I think that must have been the first time I saw the serenity prayer in its most complete form. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, its most popular form the courage to change the things I can, 
and the wisdom to know the difference. That prayer was underneath so many photographs of my classmates that it struck me. What did this mean? Only later did I realize that they were basically disclosing that they dealt with addiction in their family, most likely alcoholism in those times. They were indicating their participation in the Alcoholics Anonymous community, that there was a recovering alcoholic among their loved ones. I saw it time and again. Whatever the addiction someone participates in, whatever it is they are using or abusing, at one level or another, it's a form of self-medication, a way of dealing with struggles they feel unable to cope with otherwise. The founders of Alcoholics Anonymous recognize the deep spiritual needs that are going unmet in the lives of people who've lost control of their lives due to addiction. And this serenity prayer recognizes the need to discern between what can and must be addressed and what must be endured. And then I found out the prayer, the story behind it, and that the form we know, which is wise in itself, is incomplete with the rest of the prayer. I'd heard the name Reinhold Niebuhr. I hadn't known that he was the one who wrote it. Reinhold Niebuhr was born in Missouri, 1892, the son of German immigrants, a town of less than 400 people. And after seminary, he took his first position at a church in Detroit, Michigan, where a friend of mine is now pastor. Niebuhr had a rude awakening in Detroit in the early 1900s, the 30s. He learned in those days before labor unions how void of protection and advocacy the average worker on the automobile assembly line was. They were at the mercy of management and often found no mercy at all. Wages were inadequate, concern for safety just about non-existent. The young pastor trying to care for his flock became a labor agitator. He felt he could and must fix everything. Well, he was in for a rude awakening. As the labor movement grew, he encountered those who went too far. As he later wrote, through self-love, man becomes focused on his own goodness and leaps to the false conclusion, he called it the Promethean illusion, that he can achieve goodness on his own. So thinking they were the answer to all the problems of the human race, those on the radical extreme of the labor movement grew increasingly violent towards those they considered management. You know, as soon as we draw lines and make an us and a them, oh boy, that's when the trouble starts. Some even wanted to bomb everything belonging to management without regard for human life. The young Reverend Niebuhr discover that mankind's ability to change the human condition <laughs> was seriously limited. The abuse of power was now also displayed by those in positions of power within the union. So the serenity prayer starts to be formed. It developed over the course of at least 10 years in the life and mind of Reinhold Niebuhr. That time in Detroit taught him there are issues that could and must be addressed, the courage to change. Likewise, there are limits to human power, things that must be left to God. And wisdom would show itself in distinguishing one from the other. But he began to see that this principle, this process, these concerns needed application in issues on a greater, grander scale. Remember, He's a son of German immigrants. His family stayed connected, connected to the old country. It had to have been difficult during World War I. Things really began to get ugly in the 1930s. He was at a national student convention in Detroit, happened to be in his city. He became acquainted with the new president of 
New York's Union Theological Seminary, who offered Niebuhr, who didn't have a PhD, a teaching position designed just for him in applied Christianity. He accepted, he went to New York in the late 20s. He became aware of the struggles of pastors and teachers in Germany who refused to be co-opted by the rising political agenda of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. And as Niebuhr's colleagues in Germany, they be he became friends with them, dealt with increasingly violent threats against their life and liberty. Niebuhr yearned to do something, but an ocean separated. He fought feelings of helplessness. He had to learn to be energetic about the issues he could address. What can I do? So he actively persuaded Christians to support the war against Hitler in spite of the isolationist leanings of much of the country. But also to recognize what they could not do anything about and trust that God would handle what they could not. There was realism here, recognizing the parts of this life here that will never be totally as they ought to until the return of Christ. So with this careful attention to the work that he had to be about, a prayerful entrusting to God those things which were beyond his own capabilities, Niebuhr rose in influence through the country and beyond. And as a German-American, he had fought, ahead of many of his neighbors, the pain and fear that gripped the entire country as America entered the war. Those of you who remember what things were like during wartime knew that everyone was involved. You all felt the pinch. He established a family home in the western Massachusetts town of Heath, north of the Mohawk Trail. And he preached at the Union Church there one Sunday in August of 1943. And he gave a sermon about finding peace in troubled times. And at its conclusion, he offered the serenity prayer in its finished form for the first time. He really gifted it to the congregation, but also to the country. And it has proven to be a proven resource. We see again that serenity recognizes the limits of this life and God's limitless extravagant love for us. Well, just as there was in World War II, there are challenges to having peace in our time as well. Social media has permitted inflammatory, hurtful rhetoric to flourish and bear some of the blame for the outbursts of intolerable violence. We are becoming ourselves the most powerful argument against giving us freedom of speech. And all that prevents it being taken away is it similar to what Mark Twain said about democracy, that it's the worst possible form of government with the exception of all the others? As wars break out, as tensions increase, and our world's own environment becomes increasingly unpredictable, it's very easy to be riddled with anxiety. We can all use some serenity. The opening better known paragraph of the serenity prayer is brilliant, but it's incomplete. We must act to change what we can. We must also not become consumed with what is beyond the scope of our influence. Instead, somehow having confidence about what will happen. See, you can only accept what you cannot change if you can trust that it will be taken care of. Having confidence about what will happen in regard to what we cannot control. And the key to attaining that serenity comes in the second paragraph. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. A pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender 
to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Some of you know I love the Scottish author John Buchan, and he has this quote about how often we can have success if we do not insist on victory. I think it's related. Reasonably happy in this life so we can be supremely happy in the next. Can you accept hardship as a pathway to peace? Oh boy. It's exactly what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Suffering can be redemptive. In a much smaller way, but similar to Jesus' death on the cross, our being willing to suffer wrong so that the cycle of revenge stops with us can be a key, and it's often too absent today, a key ingredient in the recipe for peaceful relations at every level. There will always be things about this life that we find disappointing. Perhaps you've noticed. Reinhold Niebuhr had learned from Jesus that there are things that are to be left to the Father. If even Jesus didn't fix everything at once, shouldn't we take a deep breath about those things that are beyond our own job descriptions and leave it in God's hands and focus our attention on what we can, should, and must do something about? We will find serenity that way, but only as we choose to be trusting that God will make all things right in his good time. Jesus pointed to the birds of the air and the lilies of the field as proof that God can be trusted to take care of the things that we too often worry about and are ineffective to change. If we fail to surrender to God's will concerning these things, for always striving, never trusting. We will likely find ourselves interfering with his solution. I'm uh, going off script. Um, <laughs> seminary professor of mine spent a summer as a lifeguard. And I probably told the story, but it's so worthwhile about what it means to be striving so much we interfere. His name is George Ensworth lifeguard and he sees a person happened to be female could have been anybody thrashing in the water screaming for help now at this beach they had a a lightweight rowboat that they could use so he used it to get out to where he needed to be and he kind of backed the boat so that the stern the flat stern was coming up next to the woman and he yelled at her grab hold and she did she kind of took a breath, calmed down. He said, now put your feet down. She could stand. <laughs> Sometimes with our thrashing, we interfere. Meanwhile, back of the sermon. <laughs> Accepting, trusting, the act of surrender. These all require faith. There's no other option. We can only do so much individually. And while we can do more together, our pride and our stubborn self-will, which is their unavoidable characteristics of our fallen, fallenness as a human race, they block us from even accomplishing what one might think we ought to be able to do. But when we do submit ourselves in trust to the God who made us and love us, loves us, we do discover serenity. We will have clearness of understanding. We'll have quietness of heart. Stillness in spite of our circumstances. Peace in our hearts. And that's in this life. We become reasonably happy. Because although things may be imperfect, 
we are assured of the powerful, trustworthy love of God watching over us and keeping us not from hurt, but from harm. Though happiness in this life may be limited, will be limited, the trust in God that it produces, or the trust in God rather that produces it, that produces that happiness in this life. It's also the guarantee that we will be supremely happy with God forever in the life that is to come. Remember Dunkirk. Military and civilians went to great lengths to evacuate 300,000 soldiers. But it only worked because Hitler decided for no good earthly reason to stop his army from advancing all the way to the English Channel. And by the way, the British king had called for a national day of prayer two days before Hitler's forces suddenly stopped pressing forward. Coincidence? I think not. Do what you can. And there was a whole lot of striving that day, back and forth on the English Channel. Do what you can, but trust God for what you cannot. Do not allow this fallen world to rob you of your peace. Peace is found in trusting God to both take care of what you cannot impact, but also obeying God to be diligent in your attention to what he calls you to be about, including care for neighbor and for the vulnerable. Serenity recognizes the limits of this life and God's limitless, extravagant love for us. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you that you are supremely trustworthy. You do have the whole world in your hands. And so we do trust you. We don't want to be found neglecting our duty, but we also do not want to usurp your authority. Help us to be in the center of your will, not erring one side or the other. And for those who face very difficult circumstances right now, I ask you to assure them that they are seen by you, that they are cared for, if there is anything they're doing that interferes with your restoration and reconciliation and redemption of their situation. Make that clear. If there's a tool to pick up and get to work with, show them. If there's an instrument of interference that they're holding, Show them that as well. And grant, Lord, that we would have the eyes to see the needs of our neighbors and friends and strangers. That from the position of knowing that we are going to be okay in you, we might be generous with all things. That the name of Jesus Christ would receive glory and honor now and always. Amen. We'll have a special time of prayer for those who are the, those who have died that we are remembering, servicemen as well as loved ones. Uh, but let's first stand together and sing, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. It's number 591.
us join in our Memorial Day time. There'll be, I'll invite us to pray for, or to name the names of those we are remembering, servicemen and women, but also other loved ones. And when all the names seem to be shared, we'll hear the tolling of the bell. Let us be in prayer. God, we thank you that those we've lost, we can and trust to you. We thank you that there is no greater love anywhere to be found than the love you have shown us and the love we can be confident of. And you've promised that those who mourn will be comforted. And we are comforted knowing that the one who raised Lazarus from the dead also wept for him first. So thank you that you understand us and come to us in our struggles. And thank you that you promise that the day is coming when death will be no more. When you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. We remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women of our armed forces who in the day of decision ventured much for the liberties we enjoy. Please grant that we not rest until all the people of this land and every land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly accept its disciplines. We name before you, Lord, our loved ones who, whether wearing uniform or not, we remember gratefully before you now, and we name them now. For Don Reynolds. Doris Lewis.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.